been looking into the topic, who is that woman? And we are studying from the book of Revelation, the 17th, 18th, and the first few verses of chapter 19, a great uh, character that is represented. She is described often as the great whore of Revelation or the whore of Babylon. And last week I began to break down for you some of the doctrines and beliefs that are found within the Roman Catholic organization, which, yes, you may not like it, but I'm afraid to tell you it's so, that this woman does in fact and indeed represent Rome, does in fact and indeed represent the Vatican, Vatican City. It is the seat of government for the beast. It is the seat of government for the beast upon which the woman sits. The woman sits upon an organization, and that organization is the Church of Rome. Now, in Revelation 17 and verse 7, the angel says to John, I will tell thee the mystery. He said, I'm going to explain this to you, and I'm going to do it in such a way that you will clearly, unmistakably understand who this woman is. Now, I've already had people this week come at me online because their man is a hornet that this preacher dares to expose the Church of Rome as being the great whore of Revelation. Oh, that's all well and good, but I got news for you, folks. Don't give me this stupidity of, well, we really can't know because the Word of God said, come out of her, my people, that she be not partakers of her plagues. If we have no idea of knowing who she is, then how in the name of God does anybody who's in her know to get out of her? Who are we supposed to warn? Who are we supposed to tell? Because these people want to make you believe, Martin. That no, the, the, uh, understanding this is really, you know, it's too obscure, you know. That there's, we don't know enough to really know who it's a baloney. B-O-L-O-G-N-A, baloney. The description of this woman, the explanation of the angel is more than adequate to help us understand the nature and the identity of this woman. Now, I want to point us today, I inserted this for today. I want to point us to a passage of Scripture, Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 23. Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, is speaking. And he says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Listen, a good tree cannot bring forth evil. It does not say a good, free, a good tree should not. Now if a tree is good and healthy, Martin, then the fruit's going to be good and healthy. You're not going to get rotten fruit on a good tree. That's just not how it works. He goes on to say, Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. So if you have a tree that's got tree rot, growing up as a kid in New England, I used to deliver newspapers. I told my mother one time I was delivering papers at one of our neighbor's houses, and this dog come tearing around the house, chasing me, scared me out of my mind. I used to be terrified of dogs. I'm still not real comfortable if I don't know them real well, you know. 
And uh, this particular neighbor had all these apple trees in their yard, you know. And they had a big old front yard, went down the hill. And I'm tearing down that yard. And I told my mother, I said, I'm making applesauce all the way. Just stomping on all these apples that have fallen to the ground. But you know, those old trees, they'd gotten diseased and they'd gotten rotten. And, you know, and there was a lot of tree rot in them. And... The apples didn't stay on the tree. They, were, they weren't good apples. You couldn't eat these apples. They, they were not fully mature. They weren't good, you know. They grew to a point. They just started to rot, and then they'd fall off and go. I mean, you'd smell them a mile away. Smelled like an apple cider factory, you know. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot, cannot, cannot produce good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Meaning, have we not claimed to speak on your behalf? And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works, whether that be charitable works or philanthropic works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. I was never in relationship with you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. You might say, well, Pastor, why did you read that particular portion of Scripture today? Folks, the Roman Catholic organization has a history that is fraught. I'm going to say it plain, and if it offends you, oh well. It is fraught with wickedness. It is fraught with evil. It is fraught with murder. It is fraught with deception. It is fraught with lies. It is fraught with all kinds of things that are abominable and heretical. When the Word of God describes this woman as holding a golden cup in her hand full of abominations, this organization surely qualifies. Last Sunday, oh, last Sunday, last Wednesday, I read a list to you of many teachings which clearly contradict the teachings and words of the Lord Jesus Christ and the apostles of Jesus Christ. Now today I just want to run past you real quickly, if I may, some of the pagan influences that the Roman Catholic Church has seen. Uh, Hislop considers the Church of Rome during the start of Catholicism and into the Dark Ages. The symbol of the Church of Rome became the woman with a cross in her left hand and a cup in her right. It was said that the whole world was, or excuse me, is her seat. During the Dark Ages, the Bible was sealed and unknown to the common man. People were forced to believe like the church believed. The priests reserved the right of teaching the faith, and the clergy sold dispositions of the true faith of Christianity. They practiced celibacy and priestcraft and held a mysterious power of dominion over the faithful. Some didn't even realize they had simply adopted the pagan customs of the ancient mystery religions. It's not difficult to see how some of the traditions of these ancient gods carried over into so-called Christian Rome. Even in the first century, poems confused the story of the Divine Father 
mother and son with the story of Joseph, Mary, and Jesus. In Japan, Spain, and India, there were legends of three-headed gods which some confused with the Trinity, Godhead doctrine. In many lands, mother worship prevailed and was supported by citing Genesis 3.15 as proof that the mother would bruise the heel of Satan and that she indeed had power over him. The Messiah is sometimes seen only as a mediator between the goddess and mankind instead of the Messiah being seen as the Savior. He's just the mediator. He's just the one who stands between you and Mother Mary. My goodness, folks. Primary example of the analogy strong between the Babylonian mystery religions and Roman Catholicism is the practice of incorporating certain well-kept secrets that are available to only a select few. Rome ensured that the common man was studiously kept in the dark, as did Babylon. Throughout the years, Catholicism has become known for a priesthood which seems to include only members of the clergy. By discouraging the reading of the Bible in the common language of the people, the church has also discouraged personal Bible study among its non-clergy members. This in turn has tended to teach uh, lay people to become very dependent on the clergy for biblical truth and even for access to God. Now this hardly seems right when you look at the biblical teaching on the priesthood of the believer. 1 Peter 2 verses 5 and 9 where we are all encouraged to enter into the mind of God through his revealed word. The doctrine, the practice of confession the confessional had its roots in ancient Babylon. All the people were required to make secret confessions to a priest in a prescribed form if they were to be admitted or initiated into the mysteries of their religion. They were commanded to keep secret about these mysteries. Later, the Church of Rome began requiring the same type of confession for admission to the sacraments. You cannot take communion if you have not first confessed. Right. So do you follow? Do you see how they're using the identical pattern of Babylon? Babylon said in order to have, to have access to the mysteries, you've got to do this ritual. You've got to confess and you have to do it in a certain way. They're surprised. You don't just get in the little booth and say, Hi, priestie, how are you? I went with, I went and had sex with my father's wife, and then I went and got drunk. No, you don't do that. Father, forgive me, for I have sinned. How long has it been since your last confession? It has been three months. If I, do you follow? There's a prescribed ritual that you have to follow. This is all in perfect keeping, Martin, with exactly what ancient Babylon did. Even the symbol of the halo of Madonna originated in Babylon as a disc symbol of the sun god. Roman Catholic Church recognizes something called Lady Day. In pagan Rome, March 25th was a holiday celebrating the Annunciation of the Virgin in honor of Sibele the mother of the Babylonian Messiah. Consequently, on the Pope's calendar, March 25th is Lady Day, the day to observe the miraculous conception and annunciation of the Virgin Mary. Oh, how convenient. Isn't it funny that this exact day, this exact day was recognized in ancient Babylon and this exact day to this day 
is on the Pope's calendar of the official Roman Catholic calendar. All they did is rename it. All they do is put new titles on it. Since the birthdays of the two respective messiahs, Babylon's messiah and pagan Rome's messiah, is supposedly the same day, one might expect that the day of their conception might be celebrated exactly nine months before their birth. I've talked about this uh, at Christmas time. Uh, I've taught on this at Christmas time over the years. Christmas is a man-made tradition. The holiday, as it is called, uh, is based on pagan Babylonian tradition, folks. Jesus Christ was no more born on the 25th of December. This is why when you got a bunch of idiots running around screaming and hollering like Mr. Trump, that bless God, you need to say Merry Christmas in December. Hallelujah. Not Happy Holiday. But Christmas is a man-made concoction and a bunch of crap. And there is absolutely nothing in the world, any idiot Christian who thinks that there is some reason that you have to say Merry Christmas. You are as ignorant as a rock. I could care less if somebody says to me, Happy Holidays, Merry Christmas, you know, uh, seasons, greetings. What do I care? What does that matter to me? I, you know, I have friends. I have, my family has had friends growing up as a child. We have people that were friends of our family who were Jewish. You know, I don't mind saying to them, Happy Hanukkah. I understand they're celebrating a different event, you know, a different holiday. I understand that. I don't have any problem with the fact that uh, during the holidays, there are any number of holidays representing any number of different religious traditions and beliefs. And therefore, if a place of business wants to say happy holidays, so be it. Who cares? What they're trying to do is in a nice way, without being contrary or without being offensive to anyone, they're trying to kind of cover all the bases and say, well, happy holidays. If you're Jewish, happy Hanukkah. If you're Christian, Merry Christmas, you know. And that's all they're doing. And, you know, the fact that they even acknowledge the holiday at all is a nice thing. So I, I don't have a problem with that. But this is how stupid and foolish, folks, this is how foolish our modern Christian world has become over things that have no basis in fact to begin with. Oh, but we're about to go to war over it. We're, we're going to break out in civil war over a man-made tradition that is based on Babylonian doctrine dating back thousands of years before the Lord Jesus Christ. The Feast of the Nativity of St. John. <sighs> on the, Popo, on the, the papal calendar, June 24th, Midsummer Day is the Feast of the Nativity of St. John. In ancient Babylon, June 24th, commemorated the Festival of Tammuz, which celebrated his death and resurrection during June, the month of Tammuz. Hislop writes, when the papacy sent its emissaries over Europe toward the end of the 6th century, to gather in the pagans into its fold, this festival was found in high favor in many countries. The famous advice of Pope Gregory I that by all means they should meet the pagans halfway and so bring them into the Roman church, end quote. So to appease the pagans, this festival was adopted by the Roman Church, but they, of course, did not want to use the name Tammuz. There was no event of Christ's life to commemorate in June. Therefore, they contrived the scheme to celebrate this holiday as the birth of John the Baptist. 
Well, we'll find something. We'll, we'll, we'll find something that we can put on this pagan day so that the pagans can still have their little celebration. But we'll just kind of put a Christian face on this pagan celebration. Well, first of all, Christianity is not a religion of days. Again, that's borrowed from Babylon to begin with. We are not a religion of days. We do not honor and, and set aside certain days. Now, is it any big thing if you do? Not necessarily. But is that the, is that the form that we have been taught to follow? No. No. So... They contrived a scheme to celebrate this holiday as the birth of John the Baptist. The name that the Babylonians used for Tammuz after he had been slain was Oannes. Conveniently, the name John, or Joannes, therefore, satisfied both the Christians and the pagans. In France and Ireland, this festival was celebrated with huge bonfires of purifying fire across which children were thrown. This coincided with the Babylonian ritual that we read about in Jeremiah 32, uh, 35, which tells of the children being passed through the fire to the god Moloch. Now, there are other holidays that Rome borrowed from paganism. The worship of Holy Week with the sepulcher and the cross of fire coincide with the ancient festival of Stern. The date of October 7th on the papal calendar is set apart to be observed in honor of St. Bacchus the martyr, the martyr of the fire worshipers. October 9th is the festival of St. Dionysius, and St. Eleuther and St. Rustic. Dionysius was also known as St. Denise, the patron saint of Paris, who was beheaded and is said to have carried his head in his hands to his grave. This festival was abolished in 1789, but somewhat revived in the 20th century. The origin of this Christian myth also was from Nimrod, who was said to have been beheaded and worshipped. This led to the famous statues in Rome of the man holding his head in his hands. The Feast of the Assumption is observed by the Catholic Church on August 15th to honor the Virgin Mary as the omnipotent goddess who was perfect on earth and now resides in heaven. In Babylon, Bacchus rescued his mother in hell and took her to heaven. The Chinese also celebrate a feast in August in honor of a mother. The Holy Virgin in ancient times was the wife of Pluto, the god of hell. She experienced the Immaculate Conception and was absolutely immaculate. In Rome, Madonna and her child are honored in the form of graven statues. Another influence of paganism on the early Christian church is a message that one is saved by reason of works. There are rituals, there are works that you must perform to be saved. Common doctrine shared by ancient Babylon and Catholicism is the doctrine of justification by works. Merits and demerits are measured in the balance of God's justice by Anubis, the god of the scales. In ancient Babylon, and by St. Michael, the archangel, in Catholicism. The priests were the judges, and the people had to pay to compensate for their demerits. This led to, quote, the fear of the scales, end quote in the Catholic Church, as well as to the practice of absolution by paying indulgences, like Moloch, the god of barbaric blood in ancient Babylon, Greece, Rome, Egypt, 
Assyria, Phoenicia. Catholicism claimed that God was not satisfied without groans and sighs, lacerations of the flesh, tortures of the body, and penances, including worshipings and scour whippings, I'm sorry, and scourges. It was common practice for Catholics to crawl on their bare knees over sharp rocks in order to pay for their displeasing God. This is one of the things that Martin Luther found so revolting about the Catholic Church. The flagellants would even publicly scourge themselves. From the first to the third centuries, Christianity recognized this practice as purely pagan. And yet today, this is common within the Catholic belief system. Transubstantiation. In the Roman Church, the Mass is heralded as the transubstantiation or the unbloody sacrifice where small, thin, round wafers are eaten. The Babylonians worshipped Baal in the same identical way, using the small, thin, round wafers as a symbol of the sun god. The letters on the wafer, IHS, supposedly stand for Aesius Hominium Salvator, Jesus the Savior of Men. But in Babylon, they stood for Iris Horus Seb, the mother, the child, and the father of the gods. This was the Egyptian Trinity. You see, folks, the Trinity doctrine did not originate with so-called Christianity. Now, there have been notions of a trinity that have existed for thousands of years before Christ. The Trinity doctrine, again, was the pagan, it was the pagan doctrine that was used to try, to, you know, to fit Christianity into it, to make it understandable to carnal minds. Because people could not understand how that Jesus could be the Christ, a man, and how at the same time he could be God from heaven. That, that didn't settle well with a lot of people. They, they couldn't quite understand that. Well, how can he be both? Well, I mean, honestly, you know, I say this to people all the time. Now, I don't know, maybe I'm crazy. But are you going to tell me you cannot understand that God can be two places at two different times without being two different people? It's that easy. Are you going to tell me you can't understand he can be God in heaven in spiritual form and be the Son of God on earth in physical form and yet not have to be two separate beings in order to be both those places performing two different roles at one time? You can't understand it? Really, is it that hard for you to understand that? Is your God that small? Is your God that small that he can only be one place at one time, that he can only occupy one role and one position? I've talked about the fact that in the judgment, I remember preaching a message a while back here, some years back, and I talked about the fact that in the judgment, the Bible teaches us that God is going to be the judge. The Bible said we'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Is that what it says? So who's going to be the judge? Christ. But wait a minute. Who is going to be our attorney? Who's going to be the one to stand with us and for us? Christ. Well, wait a minute. Who's going to be the prosecutor? Who's the one who's going to know all the facts and bring all the facts to light? Christ. God's playing all these roles, but he doesn't have to be three gods to play all of these roles at one time. Do you follow what I'm trying to tell you? It's that easy. The concept of the Trinity reduces God. It reduces God. It makes God less than he is. In order to fit an understanding of him into some framework that human beings can wrap their mind around. 
in order for God to be God in heaven, in order for Jesus to say, my Father which is in heaven, then that has to mean he's a separate person and he's up there. Well, but wait a minute, but the Bible said God is a spirit. The Bible said, the heavens are my throne, the earth is my footstool. The Bible said, who will build a house for me? How are you going to build a building that's going to contain all of God? It's impossible. You can't do it. The Bible said, whether you go into the depths of hell or you go to the highest heaven, that God is present. You can never escape his presence. So how are you going to tell me that God is sitting on a throne in heaven and that according to your notion, he is confined? to space. He is confined to some specific framework of space. Do you, do you understand what I'm trying to say? You see, that, that's, that's us trying to reduce God and put God in human terms. But when you understand God in divine terms, God is so much more than a human being. He is a spirit. Therefore, he is forever and always a spirit. He forever and always fills all of time and space. He forever and always is bigger than anything we could ever house in the building. And he forever and always is sitting on the throne in heaven. But when he reveals himself in the person of one little tiny tenancy human form, We call that little teensy tiny human form the Son of God. Why? Because it's the only teensy little tiny human form that's ever been born of the Spirit of God. That little teensy tiny human form has no earthly father but God. No man contributed to the creation of this child, of this man, this human being. Therefore, we call him the Son of God. But that is God manifest in human form. That doesn't mean that the human manifestation of God cannot refer to the non-human manifestation of God. Or if you want to put it in this term, the greater manifestation of God, which would be the universal spiritual manifestation of God, my Father. Do you follow what I'm saying? But if we try to put it in terms of human beings, so what did the Roman Catholic Church do? Well, it was very easy, what they've always done. They reverted to pagan Babylonian teaching. And they found a teaching that could easily be adapted to accommodate a teaching that could easily be accepted by the majority of these pagans around the world that would help them to understand the Christian God, so-called, in terms that they were already using. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. You know, three people. There are three different people. Alright? We then have another pagan influence. The extreme unction. The practice of extreme unction. When death is visibly at the door, originated in Babylon as an anointing for the last journey into the mysteries. We call an extreme unction is also, boy, I'm tongue-tied tonight, aren't I? Extreme junction. Uh, extreme unction is also referred to as last rites. Purgatory. Purgatory and prayers for the dead have served both ancient Babylon and Catholicism as a special cleansing with a payment which was extorted to protect the payer from the purgatory fires. So it was a wonderful way of making money for both ancient Babylon and the Roman Catholic organization. Rome is famous for its processions. This is another thing that come out of ancient Babylon. Rome is famous for its long idol processions in which images are carried on men's shoulders, priests are adorned in gorgeous dresses, monks and nuns wear various habits, flying banners are displayed and instrumental music is played. The same was true for Babylon. Also, the clothing and crowning of images in Rome originated with ancient Egypt, Nimrod, and the Queen of Troy. Another item that we can thank pagan Babylon for origins, relic worship. Rome uses rags or bones of saints 
to commemorate their deified heroes, as did Babylon. Both artificially are multiplied, and many fake relics have been created over the centuries for profit. You know, they once said that if, if every church that claimed to have a piece of the true cross of Christ, that if they brought all those pieces together, the cross would be so big that it would stretch for miles into the sky. <laughs> and yet the church turns around, and again, this is the game. So I said, if you think the games that Donald Trump plays of creating an alternate reality, if you think that's something new, uh-uh. No, 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 no. They've been doing this for centuries. Because basically they turn around and say, well, but you know what, even if it was the fake, if you worship it as the true cross, if you recognize, then for you it is the true cross. You know, it's like they, they just talk out of both sides of their mouth, every which way but upside down. The whole idea of a relic is that it's true, that it's real. But they'll turn around and say, well, you know, we know there's far too many of those roaming around, so they can't all be real, but bless God, if you've got one, then you know what, it's real to you. So you go on and you just treat it as though it's real. The rosary. Rosary and prayer beats of Catholicism are pagan practices used in Mexico, Tibet, China, Greece, as well as by Hindus and pagan Rome. This began as the Rosary of the Sacred Heart in Babylon and Egypt, where the heart was the sacred symbol of Osiris when he was reborn and appeared as Harpocrates, or the infant divinity, born in the arms of his mother Isis. The Rosary still resembles a human heart. Also, Cupid originated in Pompeii as a boyish divinity. He was a fair, full, fleshy boy in fine and sportive action, usually portrayed tossing back a heart. Thus, the god of the heart, or the god of love, was worshipped. The bow and arrows were used to identify him with his father, the mighty hunter Nimrod taking aim with his gold-tipped arrows at the hearts of mankind, he was immortalized. The ancients deified Venus and Cupid, as the Catholics do Madonna and Child. Isn't it amazing? I mean, there are so many parallels, and you wonder why some people look at what they think is Christianity. They're looking at Catholicism, and they say, now all this crap's been around for, you know, thousands and thousands of years. I've actually had people tell me that. Oh, Christianity, there's nothing new about Christianity. All of those claims have been around for thousands of years. Well, if you go back with... But see, the problem is there are a lot of people in our world today, folks, that they honestly believe Christian and Catholic are synonymous. Right, right. Mm -hmm. They have no idea that there's anything but Catholicism and they have been convinced by the Catholic propaganda machine that everything Catholic is so-called true Christian and that anything outside of Catholicism isn't really true and isn't really right. So therefore, the real true image of Christianity they are made to believe is what they see in the Catholic Church. And they say, well, but wait a minute, you know, uh, oh, the Trinity, that, that notion existed thousands of years. I knew a man in New York City years ago who was Hindu. And he was a friend of mine, real sweet guy. And he and I were talking one time, and he told me, he said, well, we believed in the Trinity long before Catholicism came along. He said, we Hindus have had a Trinity long before Christianity came into existence. Continuing then, lamps or wax candles. La uh, lamps or wax candles of fire were used by the ancients in sun worship. The Catholic Church uses candles at Mass and at Easter, even in the daylight, although this practice was not started until the 4th century. Now, some of y'all might be sitting there saying to yourself, Pastor, why are you going through all these things with us? Believe me, as we continue with this study, when I start to show you what the angel described this woman as being, 
everything we're talking about right now, every single one of these things, you're going to hear it being talked about by that angel. So there's a reason why I'm doing it the way I'm doing it. Because when we continue in Revelation 17, and you begin to hear the angel describe this woman and the beast, you're going to sit there and say, well, holy mackerel, how could it be anything but the Roman Catholic Church? How could it possibly be? Because it's all laid out so plainly. The sign of the cross. You know how they do their little... The sign of the cross originated in Babylon and it was used as a charm before prayer which drew the initial of the name Tammuz, Ta or T. This same T can be found on the garments of Catholic priests the Vestal Virgins of Pagan Rome and the Nuns of Catholicism wore it on their necklaces. Bacchus wore a headband covered with crosses. The Buddhists wear them today. The cross was considered a divine tree, the tree of the gods, the tree of life and knowledge, and the product of whatever is good and desirable. In Catholicism, the cross is also called the tree of life. In one writing, it says, Hail, O cross triumphant wood, true salvation of the world. End quote. It is viewed as the only hope to increase righteousness and pardon offenses. Tammuz, that is spelled, by the way, T-A-M-M-U-Z, used the mistletoe tree to heal the sick. When Constantine came along, he declared, uh, or he popularized the X for Christ instead of the T for the cross. So again, both Christians and pagans were satisfied. You wonder where they get the practice, Mary Xmas? Interesting? You getting something out of this? We're almost done. I only had 45 minutes tonight because I yacked too much at the beginning. The sovereign pontiff. Catholicism views the Pope as the sovereign pontiff, representative of divinity on earth, the infallible whose laws cannot be revoked, as was the case with Esther during the times of the Medes, and the Persians, the Pope is addressed as, quote, Your Holiness, end quote, and his slipper is often kissed. He holds the keys of Janus and Sabel on his robe. But of course, they call them Peter's keys to him. Although Peter was probably never in Rome, history has confused the pagan statue of Jupiter with Peter. It's curious that the title of the high priest of Babylon was pronounced Peter. <laughs> How do you like that? The high priest of Babylon, his title was pronounced Peter. The statue that you see at the Vatican in Rome, my friend, that is supposed to be St. Peter, that millions of Catholics kiss the feet of, this statue, you know, that's Jupiter. That statue was there long before Christianity ever existed. That was not a statue created to memorialize Peter, no. It was a pagan statue, once again, that was renamed and retitled in order to accommodate the Roman Catholic Church. I'm almost, I've got two more points, so I think I can get them out within a couple of fast minutes. The College of Cardinals. Rome's College of Cardinals coincides with the Babylonian Council of Pontiffs and the pagan College of Pontiffs. The word cardinal comes from the word cardo, which meant hinge. Janus, 
the God of doors and hinges. Patokius and Clusius was the opener and the shutter, controlling the door of heaven. Peter's chair, similar to that of Hercules and Mohammed, is where the ancients were carried in pomp and state in Egypt. Janus was the incarnation of Noah, half man and half fish. The pontifical crozier corresponds to the magic of Nimrod. Lastly this evening, the priesthood. The celibacy of the Catholic priesthood corresponds with the practice of pagan Rome. You can look at Daniel chapter 11, verse 36. The clerical tonsure, a circular haircut around the temples used at ordination ceremonies, was started by Peter of the mystery gods. Head shaving was a ritual in Egypt, India, and China. Monks and nuns maintain perpetual virginity and are often isolated in convents and monasteries. The same was true in Tibet, Japan, Scandinavia, pagan Rome, and even with some American Indians. Although most modern confinement is only temporary, while in ancient times it was permanent. So I just am sharing with you this evening that there are a number of similarities, and the list goes on, and I could go down a list of how long, but again, as we continue with this study, and as we begin to see, I'm going to bring other things in, but you will not believe, folks. You're not going to believe. Anybody who has a cursory understanding of the ancient religion of ancient Babylon knows that when you look at the modern Roman Catholic Church, you're literally looking at a modern incarnation of Babylon. Mystery religion. You're literally looking at it. Right down to the colors they use, right down to the styling of their garments and their headgear, all of it is borrowed. You can look at pictures from ancient time going back to Babylon and Syria and all of these countries, and you will see, and I'll be showing it to you as we continue, you'll see that their headgear is identical to what is worn today by the Pope and the Cardinals and the Bishops. It's the same headgear, it's the same style, it's the same design. They wear the same encrusted uh, robes and garments as these priests did. And uh, so, that's as far as I can get this evening. I've got to eat. I had a couple hot dogs before church, but that had not carried me too well, I don't think. So I exactly get something to eat. But uh, I hope this helps you, though, in understanding. You see, there's a lot of, when the Bible said in her hand, there's a cup that's full of abomination because she's committing adultery. She is committing fornication. She's mixing and mingling with paganism, and she's embracing pagan things and bringing it in, into the church. And this is strictly prohibited for the New Testament church as it was in Old Testament times. Nothing of an idolatrous nature was to be touched. Never mind compromising in order to incorporate it into so-called the Christian faith. Would you stand with me this evening? Amen.